Okay, well, let me start. So today, it's pretty much following the spirit of Tuesday's lecture, sort of drawing out some consequences. Um, hopefully, you'll find a couple of the things we talk about to be sort of puzzling and curious, um, sort of maybe unanticipated properties of general complex processes that we can now talk about that we couldn't talk about if we didn't have this framework that are also strike one I think is fundamental properties. But first some logistics. So projects, right? So we're all supposed to be thinking about some projects now and then the sort of latter half of the homework due next week is to write up a project proposal. And I sort of outlined maybe in <laughs> some uh, extreme detail the things I'm looking for in your project proposal. This is to help uh, you to think things through, focus the project, hopefully uh, even some of the <laughs> questions uh, that you should address help make the projects more practical. So, so um, you know, this is a class on information processing and intrinsic computation and nonlinear dynamical complex systems. So one way to look at it is a pretty broad topic, and in fact I'm relatively uncatholic about what the particular phenomenon is. Um, but you should be thinking about some sort of nonlinear dynamical system, could be spatially extended, which we haven't talked about too much, but that's fine, that um, you have some questions about that you're interested in, and that you at least have a working hypothesis that using some dynamical system, some information theory and computation mechanics will give you some insight. In. So um, the, the proposal shouldn't be too long, two or three pages. And you know, you, you can just address these different points here with just uh, a few sentences, short paragraph. So, so the first thing I'd like you know, to be clear about what your goal is, what you think um, you'll get out of it, what would you like to learn, um, kind of a very high level description, then maybe the, the real key step is what system you're going to study. Um, some, some sort of dynamical system that's nonlinear, time dependent, uh, and then once you sort of select that, it's good to think through what the state space is, how many dimensions is the state space, What's the dynamic over that? Do you already have a model for that, uh, for, for this, for the system? Um, and then, you know, what, what about this system's behavior or pattern forming properties do you find interesting or notable or why is it studied in the past, right? This doesn't have to be dissertation research. Again, like I said before, my role is usually to take the projects back from the precipice of impossibility or dissertation level work to something that's practical that you can do in about a month. So, um, and <laughs> answers to these questions sort of parameterize difficulty sometimes. So. Um, and then, uh, you know, what, what sort of dynamical properties are interesting? Um, you're going to study a bifurcation sequence, you're going to study um, chaotic behavior, time dependent pattern formation, phase transition. Um, what dynamical properties are you going to look at? Um, also, then, then think about. What, of, of what we've been talking about in terms of in, in information processing, information generation and storage, intrinsic computation, what sort of information processing properties might be relevant, would help you understand how the system works, or even why it's interesting, right? Um, um, and of course, a methods question, what methods will you use? <clears throat> you know, I will study this set of ordinary differential equations in four dimensions, uh, the henon Hiles molecular oscillator, and uh, I'm going to use a uh, fourth order runga kata or, you know, Adams basher moulton integrator, um, and I want to estimate the Lyapunov exponents. So that would be an example, sort of answer what kind of methods, or I will calculate the block entry from the symbolic dynamics of the system. So, um, and then, you know, venture some guess as to what you're going to find. And hopefully you're setting this up so there's an interesting informational or computational question about the system. Well, how do you think that's going to turn out? Uh, the system exhibits phase transitions. It's believed to be a critical phenomenon with arbitrarily long-range system correlations. I think I'm going to find my estimates of excess entropy diverging. Something like that, you know, some kind of 
make a little bit of a guess here. Stick your neck out. Um, and then practically, <laughs> once, once this is kind of fleshed out, think about what the steps are. You know, literature search, write some code, learn the computation mechanics and Python package, improve my Sage skills, you know, um, uh, run the simulator that I've written, borrow somebody's simulator, um, analyze the data, do a bunch of experiments, analyze the data, write up <laughs> the results, you know, be a little more explicit about this. These things all take time. And then, even though it always seems a little bit ridiculous at the beginning, it's extremely helpful, at least in these steps, for each step, write down how long you think it's going to take. Obviously, you will come back and probably every week revise your estimate of time. But it's good to lay out these explicit steps and go, well, one day, two days, I'm going to spend a week on this, four days on this. And, and, the, and then the important step is totaling it up. And then you realize, oh, oh, that's 17 weeks. OK. I need to rethink this. I need to make it simpler. And again, I will be the advocate for simpler if this will help you understand the basic ideas we've been talking about. So now some people have gone on to do a publishable work that's been published or <laughs> can be published, but we haven't published yet. So, so there's a whole range of things. Um, but you know, th this is sort of a first cut. About a month worth of effort, you know, but not working full time. <laughs> you have other things to do, I appreciate. So, so, so again, the, the main sort of focus or topic should be something within information processing and computation in natural or engineered dynamical systems. You can also think about and I'll mention some examples, <coughs> but it can be engineered. It doesn't have to be a natural system. <coughs> we often get people from computer science here that study design systems. Um, definitely talk to us. The proposal that you're handing in for the homework is just the opening salvo in a dialogue, and we'll be talking to you. You can come talk to me in office hours, send me an email. When I have the proposals, I will send you comments on them. Talk to Ryan or Alec or Karana. They all have experience doing these things. Um, definitely, let's chat in the next week or two about this and get a, a good project set up. So, um, and then what's the result of all this? So once you get the sort of project moving along, <coughs> there'll be a project report that you'll give. And since we have a, a, this diaspora of people in the class that includes Berkeley, I found a location halfway between Berkeley and here in Martinez. It's accessible by train, by Amtrak, at uh, friend's very nice house. Um, uh, so the, my tentative plan is to have like a half day or kind of workshop. There'll be maybe 10, 12 projects presented, and then a barbecue. So we'll make a little party of this. So I still have to, and it'll, uh, in about a month, but we'll go around and do the scheduling thing. But, but put that in the back of your mind. <clears throat> if you have like a free day um, um, to get there. I mean, I'll also be driving down there so I can take a few people. And then people from Berkeley can easily BART and then take Amtrak up to Martinez. It's, it's a, not too uh, long a ride. Um, then uh, after, so uh, very often the, <laughs> the, the, the moment of giving your project presentation forms a great deadline. And that's when the project really gets moving, and you'll have another week or so to finish the report. So a written report that includes, you know, code, documentation of the code too, um, or um, yeah, you can hand in the written report, or some people just make a website with all that stuff attached to it. You'll see that I have uh, at the bottom of the course homepage. There's a link. I think it's the last thing on the page. Example projects. So there are projects going back eight years. So you can get some sense of what's there. Um, even, even those topics that proved out well would be worth doing. Um, uh, and again, this is just <coughs> kind of a quick, just to stimulate your thinking a little bit, maybe to indicate how broadly you can search. Um, here's just some example topics. Um, well, maybe sort of generally. Pick some complex system, cellular automaton, or the duffing driven oscillator, or the Van der Poel oscillator, and estimate some information quantities. Okay? That would be, I would say, probably a straightforward project. Start with a known nonlinear system, has different behaviors, is chaotic. Think about the symbolic dynamics. Once you get the simulation running, you can use all the facilities we have built into the Sage Campy server to estimate 
uh, entropy from sequences, entropy rates, total predictability, build the epsilon machine, which we'll talk about how to do that practically. Um, great. And hopefully you'll see that you can actually learn a lot. Um, another another kind of related thing to do is, oh, I'm interested in a class of systems. I have a um, two-dimensional spin system, and I'm interested in, I happen to know this particular version of an easing system as a function of coupling strength and, and the temperature goes through a phase transition. So that's, that, that specifies a whole family of processes. And one thing you can do is once you figure out how to estimate your chosen information or computational statistic from it, you can do a survey. Now, of course, sometimes these things require a supercomputer to do, but, you know, for this, there's enough horsepower behind um, well, the servers we have. Or if it was really compute intensive, we could help you move it over to something. We actually have a much bigger server if you wanted to get some good final statistics. Long runs, many examples, many parameter settings. We can also think about that once it's all kind of running on the base cases. Um, we talked a bit about cellular automata. There's certainly other kinds of spatially extended systems. Um, I mentioned these lattice of one-dimensional maps. Still in many ways kind of a research area. You could do some kind of pattern, dynamical pattern analysis of that. Talk about information storage and flow in space and time. Um, I already mentioned spin systems here, 1D spin systems. Um, many of these can be solved analytically, so it's interesting to kind of compare simulation results to the analytical 2D spin systems. Um, not so many analytical results. Uh, or we could think about just big topics. Mostly we've been talking about information and computation, intrinsic computation, but what's the relationship between energy and some system? So if you picked an example dynamical system that was well characterized by energy, energy conserving system, then you could explore the relationship between energy used by the system and how it was doing its information processing. This is very much a contemporary topic. In particular, there have been some recent um, experimental uh, uh, works on trying to verify various bounds between energy and information processing by doing experiments that are essentially Maxwell's demon, rectifying information, They're using information to rectify thermal fluctuations into usable work. So this goes, you know, it's been a long-standing problem, right? This goes back to Clerk Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell in the mid-1800s, and it's only in the last six years that people have started doing some serious experimental work to test the theories that are now out there. Um, another general question would be just the relationship between phase transitions and computation. Like I mentioned before, hypothesis. Systems that go into these critical states with long-range spatial and temporal correlations store a lot of history. So there are lots of statistical so mechanical systems, spin systems, POTS models is one case of that. Um, probabilistic cellular automata are another class that go through phase transitions as a function of what you might call a temperature. Um, another interesting area that's become sort of a kind of revisited in the last 15 years as, the, as Moore's law starts to poop out on our computers, how they don't get faster and faster. They don't get faster and faster because they're too hot which actually takes us back up to what I was mentioning before. So now what people are doing is they're just giving you lots of processors spread out so they can cool. <laughs> but the increasing the, the density of information processing has reached a thermal limit. So there is a fundamental connection between information processing and physical devices. These ones, that, physical devices that we have designed to do our computational bidding. And this is, there's, a, there, there's an aspect of these questions that is profoundly technological and important. Um, but so now, Moore's law, sort of failing on the current CMOS technologies, have led uh, folks to think about alternatives for doing computation. Probably the one you've heard most about is quantum computation. That if you had a computer that doesn't have, the, rather than implementing classical logic in basically many degrees of freedom, which are sort of classical physical systems, you build your computer out of physical elements that are fundamentally quantum mechanical, and then there are claims, theoretical claims, that this kind of quantum computer can actually break all of our secure codes very, very fast. Now, the technical issues, right now they're only up to about, well, I guess, well, there are different claims around, but about a dozen quantum bits, qubits, um, seem to be experimentally feasible. That not doesn't allow one to do too many interesting computations, but people are working hard on this. 
one of the technology challenges is trying to keep these quantum systems isolated from the environment around them to the extent a quantum system interacts with the environment it since it's measured by the environment and collapses down to its classical state thereby losing all of the quantum properties that give it this computational leverage so 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 that's one of the main challenges here uh, but uh, you know a nice review of that would be great. Pe people have proposed doing computation with DNA. There's a fairly recent proposal to start using actual D DNA to store, uh, uh, to use it as a database for storing uh, you know, all of our sort of digital information. Um, there, people started to revisit analog continuous um, computation, thinking about what advantages that might have. Um, this tends to be harder to, to design with when you build chips, tweak things to make them accurate, but oftentimes um, analog computers can run quite fast and they may not be accurate in the same sense, but they can be useful um, devices to explore things. Um, people looked at stochastic computation in, in, in neural systems uh, using um, um, analogs of biological evolution to solve optimization problems. I have some function I want to optimize. Well, now I think of this as what's called a fitness landscape, and I have a population of solutions that are individuals competing, and the better they do in offering partial solutions, the better performance they have, the more children they get to have in the next generation. So this is sort of algorithmic um, use of evolutionary um, procedures to optimize. It's a version of stochastic optimization. So, And of course, you know, neurobiological systems, presumably, this tissue between our ears was evolved to store and process information. That's a presumption. And somewhat oddly, even the hypothesis that it's storing and processing information is still a little bit controversial these days in neurobiology. But a lot of interesting proposals for how to think, how do you adapt information theory to work in neural systems? Um, how do you think of a spike train coming out down on axon as storing information or representing some pattern in an input. Um, quite a lot of this. Um, <coughs> other possibilities, uh, actually just doing a review. Um, um, interesting notions of self-assembly and nanotechnology. People are now building one-dimensional cellular automata out of small bits of DNA that self-assemble themselves in a in essentially in a one-dimensional space cross time diagram. Um, they claim that at some point when that gets developed, they'll be able to do sp spatial computations with DNA. Um, the other kinds of self-assembly people are studying. Uh, we'll get a couple lectures on complex materials, complex one-dimensional materials uh, in, in, in about a month. Um, there's all, a lot of interesting work, if new work in non-equilibrium uh, thermodynamics Let's us look at chemical pattern forming systems. Some of the examples I mentioned in the first lecture of the quarter describe the belosov zabotinsky reaction, really interesting. Um, same sort of mechanisms are, are been implicated in how biologic organisms form. Think of how, you know, fertilized egg turns into a blastula, turns in and so on, starts forming and suddenly at some point you have an infant that presumably is some kind of time dependent uh, process of pattern formation, forming shape, uh, really interesting area. Obviously bioinformatics, huge uh, um, area related to information in biomolecules. A lot of interesting things you can do. For example, people try to have tried to estimate epsilon machines or more simply estimate entropy rates, stored information in biosequences. And there's just tons of this stuff out there, um, you know, on publicly available databases. Um, and also more in the maybe social science sphere in economics. People are now interested in more dynamical models of economies, the world economy, or even in stock exchange, how markets get formed, uh, how markets get cleared, how that sets prices, how there are booms and busts. There are a lot of interesting dynamical models now being pursued in economics. Also great topics. Um, so here you can just review like what's currently being talked about as sort of a complex system and its information processing properties, or write some code or develop a simulation of some self-organizing system. I already mentioned these very statistical mechanical models, XY model, basically an array of little clocks that interact magnetically, Heisenberg model spins on a sphere, Potts model, cellular automata, map lattices, um, population dynamics, 
sort of ecological models, quite interesting, typically <laughs> nonlinear. <laughs> uh, there's some debate about whether the chaos that's been seen in uh, ecological models actually applies to real um, organisms in populations in, in the environment. Interesting controversial topic, and then also evolutionary dynamics. Um, um, networks, huge topic. In fact, it sort of dwarfs what we call complex systems. Now, network science is called. So we have neural networks, the internet, formation of uh, you know, uh, fads via Twitter, cascades, um, you can look at gene expression, metabolic networks, all these things people are now using. Uh, dynamical models. People are interested in how networks themselves, say through their, how nodes are connected in the communication topology, how much computation or functionality does that give to a system or take away from it? Does it add robustness? I think lots of questions. Um, also, tra tra transportation networks, traffic flow, the flow of you know, food coming into a metropolitan area, the power grid, world trade, um, lots of different kinds of models here that one could look at. Um, and uh, another possibility is we have a lab across the way, and you can build, if you'd like, a, some sort of chaotic or pattern forming system. Um, electronic circuit, I'll mention in a second, uh, mechanical device. Um, I was just at the Exploratorium. They have a number of nice little chaotic exhibits you can play with. One is a pendulum you get to drive. Another is a balancing strut that you can drive periodically and goes chaotic. Um, they often don't tell you in the little explanation that it's chaotic, but there are a number of examples in there that uh, sort of installed over the year. Um, you know, if someone was a chemist, I'd love to have someone actually implement this belisov zabatinsky pattern forming uh, reaction system. It's really very cool to see this thing actually oscillating in front of you. It's one thing to do simulations, another thing to actually see the real thing. So, um, Video feedback, this is something I played with many, many years ago back when I was trying to understand pattern forming systems. And this is, this is a pretty simple idea. Um, if, you know, if you have a camcorder, all you have to do is take the camcorder and plug it into a TV. Right? So what's a camcorder do? It takes a light field, right? projects that onto an imaging device. The imaging device in electronics turns it into an electronic signal, actually a serial signal. And then what's a TV do? TV takes an electronic signal, turns it into a light field. Well, what you do is you point the camera at the TV screen. So the image coming in gets converted by the camera into electronic signal that then goes around and then becomes an image on the screen, which then in the optical domain then gets converted by the camera back into electronic signal and around and around you go. It's an iterated system. And then what you do, the basic instructions are mess with all of the knobs. So the important thing is you take the camera and you actually turn it so that means the image, every time it comes around, gets rotated a little bit. That kind of stabilizes what you see. Um, and then you take and crank up the contrast and the brightness and turn over the hue and whatever. And then after messing around, it takes a little bit of patience. Suddenly what you'll see, you can take your hands off this, no more messing around. You'll see images start to dance around on the screen spontaneously. So it's a wonderful pattern forming system. In fact, you can reproduce most of these other pattern forming examples, the, 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 the kinds of dynamics and behaviors and the patterns that get generated in, in using this video feedback system. So I've got a setup in, in our lab that one can play with if you're interested in doing an experimental project. But it's very, very rich. Also, it's kind of nice compared to if you're doing chemistry, well, there are all sorts of issues about doing the experiment. The time scale for this belisov zabatinsky reaction is on the order of 5, 10, 15 minutes. It's kind of slow, in other words. This thing, 30 frames a second, you get lots of data. So you can sample that, analyze it. Anyway, lots of possibilities. Um, maybe more mathematical ones, um, and there have actually been quite successful sort of more mathematical uh, projects on uh, dynamical systems. One is looking at how chaotic behavior reacts to you, when you add external noise to it. Does it destroy it? It's, un it's un unstable, so if I add noise, does it destroy it or does it enhance it? Um, you can look at how external noise varies, uh, various different kinds of bifurcations or routes to chaos. Um, and that was important, for example, in discovering that 
what's called weak turbulence actually had a chaotic attractor in it because any real experimental system isn't going to be running at 64 bits of precision like a digital simulation. It'll have some, th it's, 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 it's has a physical embedding, therefore there's thermal agitation. So there's just sort of the macro scale that you're seeing, the nonlinear dynamics, the few modes coupling nonlinearly, non and then just below that level, there's some thermal effect, which you have to take into account. Um, looking at the, just how various nonlinear systems evolve probability density, densities. We talked about that for uh, one-dimensional maps, starting with initial distributions and see how they changed. We also looked at the dot spreading examples with the um, ODE simulations, Lorenz and, and uh, Rustler attractors. You, you can try the same kinds of studies there, but also then say tracks since you have a probability distribution at each moment in time. How is the entropy increasing in, the, in that probability distribution? Where is the information being generated? Um, calculating, uh, maybe this is maybe a more technical thing, for a mathematician, how do you approximate invariant distributions? Right? Remember, invariant distributions are a kind of a fixed point uh, in the space of distributions. They come back to themselves under the dynamic, so that's a fixed point equation you can try to solve. Um, or you can look at how you converge to it when you start with distributions very far away. Um, and there are various kinds of, of computation mechanics and informational analyses of the evolution of probability distributions you can do. Um, now, there also are other ways of looking at chaotic behavior rather than the set of trajectories and looking at the state space. Um, more classical ways of looking at it are Fourier analysis, assuming that the signal coming out, X of T coming out of the Lorenz system, is best described in terms of Fourier components. Well, we sort of did that when I, we did the demo, the audio demo, because our ears hear in terms of frequency in the frequency domain. Um, and it sounded noisy. So there's a puzzle here. Why, when I'm doing Fourier analysis, and I look at a low dimensional, like Rustler Lorenz, in three dimensions, why, why is it noisy? Why does it look broadband? What's, what's going on there? Why, with this chosen analysis method, does it look like it could be an infinite dimensional system with all frequencies excited? How does that happen? So even this, what, what might seem like a very conventional kind of project, has some interesting kind of quest questions uh, uh, that arise immediately. And there are other kinds of analysis, you know, wavelet analysis, trying to figure out. And, and these, you know, Fourier and wavelet analysis are used a lot in time series, all over the place, experimentally. So there's even kind of a, a, a meta lesson here. If you take a known nonlinear system that you're familiar with its geometry and so on. We think we understand it, we had even estimate its entropy rate, how it evolves distributions, and then you look at it with these techniques, are the results, or, or the interpretations you get from a Fourier analysis really describing the system itself, or are you being misled by the characteristics that the an analysis methods are adding in? It's, so even the simple thing, it's kind of sobering to think through. <laughs> What's going on? It makes you a little suspicious whenever you start to study an experimental system. It, are my chosen set of methods giving me a view of what's really going on, or are they coloring things? Right? So, so even FOIA analysis has interesting things. Um, people use nonlinear systems actually now for doing data encryption. Actually, also for music generation and all sorts of stuff, so they're interesting. Anyway, just some topics I just kind of threw up there. Um, um, if one were philosophically inclined, a number of the, although we're doing kind of more mathematical, theoretical development of the ideas of intrinsic computation, it does bring up a number of basic philosophical issues, which you might call, sometimes I call it <coughs> experimental epistemology. This is what I think I do. I'm trying to understand how we come to know something. And we have to make some commitment to what a pattern is and how structured things are some commitment to a notion of what randomness is to start to analyze how scientists build theories, how adaptive organisms move through their environment and survive. So this brings us right up to a number of philosophical issues like what is causality? Is there sort of this semi-raging debate, although maybe it's a small community, between people in computer science and artificial intelligence who have one notion of causality. That they're trying to recapture the notion that, it, that scientists do experiments on the world. It's only through interaction with the system that you can detect the causal independence, causal, sorry, dependence between uh, what you do and the structure of a system. You can't really learn the system's causal structure unless you interact with it. You intervene 
You make hypothesis. So if I take this apart, then that thing won't happen. The problem, of course, is that this flies immediately in the face of everything we've been doing in terms of looking at systems on their own terms. If I take, for example, to be concrete, if I take the Lorentz set of three differential equations and remove one of the terms, it's not the Lorentz system anymore. The Lorentz attractor is this emergent property that takes x, y, and z interacting through how the, the, you know, the vector field or the right-hand side to produce that big attractor. I can't go in and intervene without destroying the thing, just like I mean, it's common criticism of reductionism applied to life. There's a problem there. So <clears throat> this is definitely <laughs> been kind of brought up again, um, in particular uh, in the big data era. How can you, from just doing data analysis, conclude that the world is structured somehow? Well, we have our answer here that we're developing. We have a way of going from the raw data we claim and building this. But that picture is not that well integrated in with these, these other views yet. So, so, purpose, what's the role of purpose in the system and how does purpose emerge? Also a very interesting thing. How does the system become sort of smart enough or have a model of the world and then be aware that it has a model of the world so that it can as ascribe <laughs> you know, so, some, some goal state for the world it's interacting with? Um, and of course, randomness. But the interesting thing here that I'm sort of calling out is there are very interesting studies, psychological studies, of how, how bad humans are at detecting randomness. So this famous, he's, he's now passed away, Amos Tversky, a psychologist down at Stanford years ago. Um, <laughs> how uh, people tend to dismiss events that seem too ordered as not being consistent with randomness. But if I flip a coin five times, it is possible that I get five heads, but people say, no, 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 something is wrong there. But it's okay, right? It'll happen one in 30 times. <laughs> so, um, same thing with coincidence. You know, our sort of sense of wonder, like, oh, you've got the same birthday. Isn't that amazing? Or, you know, we all have this sense. One first kind of wonders where that comes from some sort of surprise relative to a model or expectations we have. But there's a very nice paper by a friend of mine down at Stanford in the math department, Percy Diaconis, on basically analyzing the, the sort of mathematical likelihood of coincidences. It's based on this thing called the birthday problem. Right? If you have a room of 35 people, you can basically just stand up and make the claim, two people in this room have the same birthday. And 95% of the time you'll be correct. And everyone will go, wow, how did you do that? Well, you work out the math, and that's just a likely thing. Because when you make a statement like that, you're talking about an equivalence class. It could be any number of pairs of people. And therefore, there are lots of those pairs. So this is an interesting trade-off. Anyway, nice, nice paper. Uh, I may or may not have this on the supplementary reading list, but someone's interested in that. Um, Percy spent many years uh, uh, as a, well, he ran off to the circus in high school, and then. Uh, developed uh, talent as a magician, and then he spent many years debunking magicians. So he's a very colorful writer. It's a great, it's a great uh, paper. Prediction. That means somehow has to go along with causality. What do we mean by prediction? Um, and also, this, there's this interesting um, uh, historical era, kind of based around the mathematician Norbert Wiener in the 40s and 50s, but there's Claude Shannon and John von Neumann and Alan Turing and all these interesting characters in the mid-20th century. Uh, sort of developing this field that, that Norbert Wiener called cybernetics, which of course we hear again, and sometimes I think a little bit of what we're doing, like in the class, is revisiting a lot of the original motivations of cybernetics. So control and information processing and engineered and, and biological systems was his interest. So um, there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful uh, biography of that period. It's about, he focuses mostly on Wiener, called Dark Hero of the Information Age. It's a great, a great read. If you find any of these topics interesting, there has been sort of this historical hole about, well, why there are no departments of cybernetics in the West, but there are in the former Eastern Bloc countries. Deep political um, and sort of personal peculiarities determine a lot of the history of how we deal with information and computing. Anyway, it's kind of hinted at there. Um, so, some examples um, from past years. So, so. Um, actually, so Christina, uh, last spring, actually it was last winter class 
a year ago, she actually built an analog computer in the lab, a little Vanderpool oscillator. She was interested in trying to understand the role of feedback and what it meant for a system to, when you finally got all the pieces hooked together, to have an emergent property to self-organize. So. Yeah, I was studying part of uh, the oscillation patterns, and they used the Vanderpool oscillator yeah. as a model for heart sequences. Right. So I was trying to go from biology to electronics right. to this. Right. right. Yeah. So this this uh, it's called Vanderpool. Uh, oscillator. That's Balthasar van der Poel. Um, he sort of worked through the 1920s and 30s, and one of his first interests was in, in heart arrhythmias. And so he built these vacuum tube-based oscillators, whose equations we studied <laughs> last quarter um, uh, to, to study, um, in the, use, essentially an analog computer to study as he varied the coupling between the sinus node and the arterial node, the instabilities that could happen. So. Uh, Nikki Sanderson, she was a math student. She did basically a mathematical kind of project um, looking at how looking at how thinking of epsilon machines as generators and then as you vary the transition probabilities you change the distribution over words in particular you can turn off a transition and how that generates a different kind of process so in a sense she was looking at the relationship between different stochastic processes in particular using the epsilon machine representation of them and seeing how these different epsilon machines were related to each other as you varied the transition probabilities so there's actually an architecture to the space of epsilon machines or equivalently to the space of stochastic, structured stochastic processes. So we're still talking about, she, she went off to applied math and, uh, at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, Bikram, physicist, actually works with Risa D'Souza on networks, but uh, the project he did was studying phase transitions and looking at computation and the complexity in phase systems with phase transitions. In fact, he's still working with this on some work we're gonna publish along these lines. Charlie Brummett um, also works with Risa D'Souza. He looked at networks of chaotic maps, so sort of like that lattice of one-dimensional logistic maps, but now arbitrary interconnection topology. Adapted a notion of this called directed information from the literature. Does, you know, is information flowing from node A to node B or from node B to node A, and how does that relate to the dynamical behavior that supports it? Um, and then he, then, then he made his network grow based on how the information was flowing on the network really complicated, probably so complicated that this would easily turn into a dissertation topic. He's off doing other things now, but it was a nice, just first cut. Very exploratory, I, you, know, measure, he, you know, at, at root it was developing a little simulation system. I have logistic maps on some randomly connected communication network, and I and he went around and measured various kinds of mutual information in the, in the, from the local symbolic dynamics to see if that was correlated with the behavior and help them understand how the set of nodes would kind of cluster together and synchronize. and this. This group wouldn't. Uh, Luke Gretzky, mathematician, he basically developed that whole, I mean, I just had one slide on it last time on uh, epsilon machines as semi-groups. So he was interested in this sort of algebraic analysis of, of these machines, other kinds of properties of that. Wrote a very nice paper that maybe someday we'll publish. Uh, uh, Paul Rikers, who was actually working with Christina, oh, I didn't mention, okay. Um, he looked at um, this, extending computation mechanics to space-time. So rather than a one-dimensional time series, you have space and time, and how can we talk about the storage of information and the flow of information in space-time? Um, right, so Christina's other project, which she did during the spring, was to look at uh, viney plants in her yard called passion flowers, and they grow these little tendrils so that they go from one vine to another, and they makes the, 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 the whole plant as a whole well, climb up walls, but then also be more robust. And so she ended up discovering that the literature was wrong, that these tendrils, uh, in the literature, the, the tendrils were supposedly always holding on to two things, that they would never grow free. Well, in fact, a lot of them are free, and so she and Paul studied the pattern formation dynamic as they kind of search around and coil up and become springy. And tried to symbolic dynamics, even for this coiling left, right, Typically, the, so the generic state is there's this helical coil, but then every once in a while, it'll go from clockwise to counterclockwise. When it does that, there's a little region, a little kind of loop that's called a technical term, a perversion. 
And so we studied the perversions in passion flower tendrils. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really nice project. We're still working on this. Yeah, 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 we're still. Uh, you remember Ryan, so he's Tiang now. He, he looked at, kind of similar to Paul's project, just calculating block entropy in one space, one time dimension, right? We were talking about block entropy so far, but that's a, a word. <laughs> And we look at how the block entropy grows as we make the word longer. Well, in two dimensions, you have patches. So how do you even define a block entropy? Well, you can define a distribution over patches and do P log P, but then it turns out there's some interesting questions about what limits do you take and so on. So just kind of exploring that. Uh, ben, current student of mine, <coughs> he gave a kind of a book report on the state of quantum computation, kind of compare and contrast with computation mechanics. Watson looked at Spiking models, he's doing this now for his dissertation research. Uh, Paul was from psychology. He was interested in, in, in uh, models of, of cognitive adaptation, learning, and how that was related to various kinds of uncertainty in the model. Um, and then Nick Travers, mathematician, he looked at the computation mechanics of elementary cellular automata and also trying to come up with a, a metric between different epsilon machines. So, anyway. These and more are listed down through that link at the very bottom of the homepage. Okay, so that's, yeah. So it sounds like we have quite a bit of flexibility, basically just have to use the vocabulary and devices yeah. of this course. Yeah, the methods, right, yeah. yeah. Some dynamical system, something nonlinear, non-trivial behavior, can be chaotic or could be like a spatial pattern forming system. And then hopefully, you know, that behavior, you know, suggests some, that somehow information, production, storage, intrinsic computation are involved in that. And then the you know, projects are typically some kind of, uh, that kind of analysis and then comparing it to the dynamical behavior and how the dynamical behavior and structure of the system supports that. So, yeah. yeah. You know, and and don't, don't, don't hesitate to be too simple. It, it's pretty rich. Like you could, you could just take a driven, uh, you know, Vanderpoel oscillator and just study that. All these systems are actually quite rich. So, um, and of course, if it's so simple and you get it all figured out, well, I have lots of suggestions to make things more complex. So, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. That's, that's my job. <laughs> that's my day job. Okay. Um, any other questions on projects? Or? Okay. Good. All right. So now, back to the main program here. Uh, information diagrams for processes. Well, so at the end of the information theory section, the winter uh, class, uh, we talked, I introduced information diagrams. Um, but now we have this new representation. In fact, we can think about it. We actually have a new set of random variables, namely the causal states. So what I want to do is review a little bit what I introduced, because that was, I guess, more than a month ago we went over this. So I'll review a bit how we use these information diagrams. And they're a very handy graphical tool that helps suggest sort of mathematical properties or at least hypotheses. Um, they're in a sense not absolutely necessary because you know at the end of the day if you're doing a proof or calculating something it's symbols on paper but it's they're extremely suggestive and very helpful. So, so I, and by way of getting there I want to first throw up a little question um, that's somewhat of a harbinger of what we're going to talk about um, in a couple weeks, um, but also to kind of motivate the use of the information diagram and a generalization we're going to do uh, next week. So, so and that, that question is, um, just looking at these processes, we, we have these stationary pr processes, um, what properties are time symmetric and what properties are time asymmetric? Um, so, We'll have some process, again, distributed here, given some distribution over the bi chain of bi-infinite random variables. We have the past and the future here, left, right going arrows. And now I want us to think about the sort of the forward process, or one way to say it is that's, what I, when I give it to you, that's what I'm giving you, the, the forward process or the given direction, call it forward. And that is what I'm thinking of is that the random variables, there's an index that increases as I go left to right. Okay. Um, now, you know, this could be a spatial lattice too, and then this notion of forward or backward would be um, bad terminology. It would then just be looking at it going from left to right. Now, 
what we're going to do is contrast to the reverse process. The basic idea is we just scan things in the opposite order. If I give you a bunch of data, maybe I give it to you on a hard disk and I don't tell you what direction I stored the data in, you don't know as you scan through the data. I tell you it's a time series, but I forget to tell you whether time is increasing with memory address or decreasing with memory address. Some computers actually store things the opposite way with decreasing memory address when you load things in. So it's not obvious. So what I mean here is by the reverse process. So forward process is just the one we, we've been talking about arrow going to the right, uh, reverse process, arrow going to the left. And what I mean is that if we start with our chain of random variables, I present it in the opposite way, so that the, the indices would decrease. But the idea is very simple. I, I give you this, this process, chain of variables, you scan it this way, and you scan it this way, and the question is, what properties are the same, and what properties are different? Okay, so first thing, we can imagine, we can ask to define a quantity called the forward entropy rate. That's the entropy rate of the forward process. And this is, if you might say, in sort of prediction mode. I'm trying to predict the next symbol given the past, some arbitrarily long past. So this is what we've been working with. I'm just adding some notation, you know, little arrows and pluses and minuses. You can also ask, it's easy to define, very natural to say, oh, well, what's the, uh, what's the entropy rate of the reverse process? And that's easy to think about. I've been sort of looking at the future. I come up to the present, and I try to predict the previous symbol. So forward mode is I have a past. I probably predict the next symbol. The reverse way is I'm, I've looked at all the future, and I try to predict the previous one. Okay. So those are all well defined. Question. In general, if I give you some complex process, which direction is most unpredictable? Future. So we have forward. We have two choices. So we. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to entertain all responses to the question. <laughs> you could give, you could give, I could give you the complex system one way. Exactly. Right? And then I could give you the reverse complex system. So and how would you know if I don't tell you? Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. So you're saying it's equal? I could. <laughs> um, or, it, or it could be, I mean, what Quinn was just sort of bringing up, there could be no natural association with the direction I give it to you. They could be different, but then, you know, sometimes I'll see it larger in one direction than another. You know, so it could, it could just be... Um, your, your choice of which is forward. Yes, right. It's right. arbitrary. arbitrary, right. But there still could be differences, right. So some processes presented forward have... They're more predictable forward and less predictable reverse, and other processes vice versa. So does that apply at all to like Yeah. Well, no, but this, this issue of time asymmetry does, or symmetry does come up in thermodynamics. So here's the punchline. They're equal. Whether I'm scanning this way and trying to predict the next symbol of the future or retrodicting, the entropy rates are the same. For stationary. For stationary process, yes. Right. Yeah, if it's non-stationary, I could make up all sorts of weird things where yeah, it's, it's like this giant Markov chain, and after this, it's DC constant value or something. So then, right. Um, but anyway, so general stationary ergodic process, forward and reverse scans of the process are, have the same entropy rate. They're equally unpredictable. And it's not too hard. The proof isn't too long, so we'll do it here um, to sketch out why. So we're going to take our, you know, our definition of the forward entropy rate. And that, again, is just the uncertainty next symbol given the past. And again, now let me be a little more careful about looking at now a finite length past. So, so I'm going to think of blocks now of length L, um, histories of length L, and then how they predict the next symbol. Um, now this is a conditional entropy, and we went through the argument in previous lectures, I can rewrite this conditional entropy as the difference between two block entropies. Remember we were talking about the block entropy growth? 
and there was a two-point slope estimate, that was the argument going this way. So difference between the, the block entropies at two different lengths. Length L, length L minus one. That's equivalent, just through a little information identity to this conditional distribution. Okay. But the process is stationary, therefore I can just do a time shift. So I'm gonna take this block here, this one over here, length L minus one, and just shift it up so that the last symbol is at time zero. So I'm just talking about the entropy of this block here, same as the entropy of this block here. As long as it's still, as long as it's the same length, the origin of time makes no difference due to stationarity. Okay, so I just replace that guy in there. So now I have this forward entropy is now the difference between these two, these two block entropies here. The first one is still the same as before, but now I shifted this one. But by shifting it, what, I, what I'm gonna do is then actually use the same identity up here, and that lets me pull out, there's an extra random variable here, and that's the one that is the, the um, when I convert back to this conditional entropy, that's the one that I'm, whose uncertainty I'm trying to, to uh, estimate here. And then I'm conditioning it now on this L minus one block that shifted a little bit. So all I've done here is really just shift this uh, in time, and, but actually sort of reverse it. So here I was looking at a past, a past and trying to get x0, and now what I've just done down here is I'm looking at the next block and trying to get the previous one, right? This one further back. I essentially just reverse the time. Um, <coughs> well, just change notation here just to make it a little, visually a little easier. Assume now we're conditioning on these infinites. Now this is a future, right? I'm, Right, so, so this is this symbol here uh, located in time. This block is what follows after it. And now I'm gonna let this get longer and longer. And that essentially is a future, but attached at this time index. But then that is, by stationarity, I can just shift this all down. Basically, I can set L to whatever I like. So I'll just set L equal to zero, and then we have this previous symbol conditioned on the future, an infinite future. And that is the entropy for the reverse process. So this depends on stationarity, as you pointed out. So again, just real simple information identities and a little trick of shifting the time origin. So the entropy rates are time symmetric. Both directions are equally predictable, if you like, or at least equally predictable asymptotically, right? H mu is the asymptotic large um, <coughs> conditioning history limit. Okay, well what about, um, the excess entropy? Well, the excess entropy of the forward and reverse process, they're equal, and, th and th this proof is just trivial, right? Excess entropy, of the forward process is the shared information between the past and the future. Excess entropy between the reverse process is the, this mutual information between the future and the past. I just swap these things, but we know this function i, i of x, y, it's symmetric in x and y. Right. Inside the log, we just have the joint over the marginals, and it doesn't matter how I write them down. So it's just immediately. So. <coughs> So, so both the entropy rate and the excess entropy don't really indicate any kind of temporal asymmetry in the process. They're equal. Okay, fair enough. I don't know whether that's intuitive or not, but there you have it. Facts of the matter. Any stationary process has equal entropy rate and <coughs> equal excess entropy in forward or reverse scans. Okay, but what about, we now have this new thing we're working in, this new construct, the epsilon machine. So just kind of formally here, though we're gonna talk about the forward and reverse epsilon machines that we get from the forward scan and reverse scan. So formally, I just kind of write that down. It's the forward process mod, the predictive equivalence relation, and we get this forward machine, M forward arrow, and then reverse machines. Just, we start with the reverse scan process and get it. So the question is, how are these guys related? Or the other way to phrase it, is a process differently structured in forward and reverse time? We have a no, 
you've been here before, you're saying yes. <laughs> okay. Right, you, you think, given the way the previous things went, it's sort of like, come on. Right. So are those the same equivalence relations for both of them? Yes, exactly the same. So, so here, right, good question. So here, when I apply this, what I mean is, this, I'm, to, to make the M's, M forwards causal states, I'm grouping past to predict the future. Yeah. And then here, I'm grouping futures to predict the past. Okay, so the are switched to correspond. Yes. yes, absolutely, yeah. There's a little bit, we have different choices about what gets reversed. So sometimes the vocabulary can kind of be a tongue twister, but yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, so can it be differently structured? Or the other way to say it is, do I have to use different resources, different amounts of history or future to predict at what is we just agreed was equal entropy rate? So basically, our definition is different. Right, right, that's the question, yeah. What did you say, sorry? The Epsilon machines are different going forward. Or right, right. M forward, M reverse, are they the same or different? Can they be the same or different? They should be the same complexity, but they should be different. Ah, good, okay. So in general, they, they can be different. Depends on the process. I mean, if I give you one, 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 okay, come on, <laughs> that's all the same. So, okay, they can be equal, but the, the surprising thing now, and again, just to kind of emphasize, now that we have this structural view of a process, there's this, this is a new question we can ask. And it turns out, in general, the forward and reverse machines aren't the same. I find that strange, especially in light of the result for entropy rate and excess entropy. Um, and also, the, the numbers, the amount of information stored. So, right, so that you had a more subtle guess. Maybe in, you know, there's, some, there's some very detailed difference, but when I look at the amount of memory that they're storing internally in the causal states, that could have been the same too. Well, that can happen. You can have these be different and this be the same. This is just a scalar number, so there's structural variations. <clears throat> so, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll do the proof by example. <clears throat> so going back actually to the logistic map, that's how I first discovered this. So uh, it turns out if you look at one of these Misarevich parameter settings, so remember we have the logistic map, and we have this control parameter r, r times x times 1 minus x is the functional form. Um, you can find one of these Misarevich parameters where the maximum um, becomes a fixed point. After four iterates, it becomes a fixed point. So those, if you think of the bifurcation diagram, that's where the veils are, and the veils all cross. You know, maximum, minimum, and then you iterate, and then the fourth becomes equal to the fifth. And there's a way, with this equation, you get exactly the parameter setting at which that happens. If you remember, uh, these, where, the, where we have a Misarevich parameter setting, the, the distributions on the interval are very nice, and so you can actually calculate things pretty accurately. And then if we fix this parameter setting in our logistic map of the interval, and then use the generating binary partition about a half, Here's what we get when we look at, now there's a notion of forward because the map iterates forward, right? X of n plus one is equal to some function of xn. So we're iterating forward. If I look at the forward binary sequence I get out, I get this machine to, to some approximation. Um, four states, uh, start state is recurrent. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there's one transition here. This, unit probability, go through and of course and calculate the forward entropy rate. So about 0.8 bits per symbol and you can calculate by uh, the statistical complexity by calculating the left eigenvector of the transition matrix to get the asymptotic state probabilities, p log p that, and it's about 1.8 bits. Okay, well here's the data, I gave it to you, right, it generated, this is actually done in just the simulation, you know do a million iterations, get a million bits, throw it into this and calculate your coolants classes and transition structure. Well, you can scan it in the opposite direction. Really easy to do algorithmically. And this is what you get in the reverse direction. So it's not the same. There are four causal states, but now there are three recurrent causal states and one transient state, which is the start state. All right, as soon as I see a zero, I just rattle around down here. Check our theorems. Go back and calculate from this. We actually get about 0.8 bits per symbol for the entropy rate, the unpredictability. But then now the 
we have P log P over three states, we get about 1.4 bits of statistical complexity. So, right, so, so what does this mean? Right. It means that in the forward direction, sort of asymptotically, looking at the recurrent states, I have to sort of make more distinctions using four causal states or remember more from the history in order to optimally predict at this rate, which is the same in both directions, 0.8 bits per symbol, than if I go in scan in the opposite direction. There's less effort required. The machine, in some sense, is smaller if we're using this stored information measure of statistical complexity. It's smaller. Easier, I don't know what words you want to use, to, to retrodict the symbolic dynamics for this misbehavior setting in the reverse direction than in the forward. Is, it, is this related to the Lyapunov exponent, and then which are spreading from? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Right. So, so, um, okay. So the direct relationship between these two analyses is that the Lyapunov exponent, and we know this because this Misovich parameter setting has uh, a distribution on the interval that is well behaved, called absolutely continuous, measured with respect to Lebesgue. In that case, the Lyapunov exponent is equal to the entropy rate of the symbolic dynamics. Now, there's, well, and which was the same both ways, so it somehow did, didn't quite capture it. Now, it's, it, it's, it's, you think about this one step more, you're going, no, wait a second. I'm, what does it mean back in the original dynamical system to go in reverse time? That's not what we're talking about here. We're just scanning a process in forward and reverse. We're not inverting the map and running it in the other direction. That's a different set of questions. And, and in particular, if we did that, we would change things that were unstable spreading in the forward iteration to things that were contracting. So we're not doing that, but it's, it's, it, it's an excellent question, actually. <laughs> Let's be careful here, yeah. Right. We're just using the map as a generator of a binary process and asking this question about the statistics of the word distribution from that not pulling it back to the original dynamical system. But that is an interesting question. And we can you know, measure this d difference of time. Uh, we call it the causal reversibility. It, again, it's just a scalar. It's just the difference between the forward and reverse machines. And again, the, whether it's positive or negative doesn't really accord with any natural notion of how the data is presented to you or what the original direction of time is. There are examples that go both ways. So, so, but it's just kind of a handy thing to say something is causally reversible, this is zero. Causally irreversible, it's not. In the case of the Misravich process, we had about a third of a bit. Difference in state information. Had to use more of state information to predict than to retrodict. Okay, so, so yeah, causal irreversibility. So, so just to sort of summarize this, it, the, the information that you need to remember in order to optimally predict and optimally retrodict differs, can differ. Um, even though the amount of unpredictability is the same in both directions. So this is just sort of one, one puzzle here. It kind of um, brings up a couple questions. For example, if I gave you quote, the forward machine, can you, well, it generates the process. If I generate the process, I can scan it in the other direction, and then I could get the epsilon machine from that. Is a way of going directly from the forward machine to the reverse machine. An analytical way of doing this. And the answer is yes. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. And there are also some other interesting properties that I'll now illustrate getting back to the information diagrams sort of along these lines. This point about temporal asymmetry and what we're going to talk about now, um, how hidden information is, state, informa state information is, are really kind of setting us up for the techniques we'll introduce next week. Okay, so just this was like a, a month or so ago. What are information diagrams? Well, you remember if we had just two variables, right, we have, we represent, it's like a Venn diagram. We have a uh, random variable x and then the size uh, I mean, the, the size of it is, is represents the amount of entropy in that random variable. 
We have another random variable y, colored in yellow. We have that. Um, we have uh, the joint entropies represented by summing these pieces up. Okay, h of xy. We have uh, conditional entropy, the uncertainty of x given y. You should imagine that's the set theoretic operation of I have my entropy in x, and then I get rid of, I subtract out y's contribution. So this conditional entropy is this red crescent here. Same thing over here for the uncertainty y given x. We have the information in y, and I carve out x, and so it's this yellow crescent. The overlap was the mutual information. And then we even had this distance measure, which was the sum of the two conditional entropies, the two outside crescents. Anyway, so this is just a review of the earliest information theory thing we were doing. Um, what's sort of more interesting now is to think about a three variable I diagram, which we covered. So we have three variables, x, y, and z. We have various information measures, you know, um, single variable marginals, uh, three variable joint, uh, the three way overlap, you know, three way mutual information, the various conditional entropies, conditional mutual informa informations are all possible information measures. There, there are seven atomic uh, smallest pieces. Um, so we have, again, in the Venn diagram picture, we're building up to do this for processes. Uh, we have now these three variables, x, y, and z, and their sizes. Um, we have first these atoms. So we have the uncertainty in y condition on x and z, which means we have you know, the uncertainty in y. We carve out the z and x pieces. Same thing here. This little wedge over here is the uncertainty in x condition on y and z. We subtract out the y and z pieces and so on up here. Um, these little shield pieces in here, these are, mute. first of all, they're mutual informations. So between y, y, and z, but then I subtract out the x piece, so it's conditioned on x. Same thing down here. I have the mutual information between x and y, but then I take out the z piece, and so on for here. So I'm showing you what the so-called atoms are, the smallest pieces in this. And then, of course, the center, the three-way overlap, that's the mutual information between x, y, and z. So we have this nice graphical picture of this. Uh, we also talked about uh, what happens when there is this Markov chain relationship between the three variables, right? X goes to Y goes to Z, right? And the main property of a Markov chain was that, the way we've described it sort of narratively, is if I know Y, I shield Z from X, okay? Well, that has a consequence down here, right? So what's the main consequence of a Markov chain? Well, it means that the information shared between x and z, if I know y, is zero. That's the informational statement of shielding. It means this little piece down here is zero. So in the case of a Markov chain for three variables, this all simplifies. And we have this, it's almost like a fan fold here. I just sort of slid down the upper variable and got rid of that little piece down there. Uh, one consequence of a Markov chain is that all of the mutual information between x and z here, that would be this overlap, is contained within y. Maybe that kind of makes a little sense if notion of shielding, whatever y, I mean y's got to encompass that so that if I fix y, I fix all of this and then all I have are these two other pieces that don't overlap, therefore there's no relationship between them, they share no mutual information. Uh, in addition, when we have a Markov chain like this, all of these areas or their associated information measures are positive. If you remember, in the general three variable case, we went through that x plus y equals z made the third variable z that was a sum mod two of the other two variables, and we showed that this guy could be negative. So the general statement were that, was that these various measures are a signed measure, which means sometimes you have to be very careful when you make an area on your two-dimensional diagram. You have to indicate it might be negative. I was playing around with the 3D plots where this, you know, if it was negative, it was the divot and it was positive, it would be above or something, but you have to be a little bit careful of this. We had this other representation, maybe it's more useful when you have a lattice of random variables like this. Exactly the same set of atoms that are positive are shown here. I just kind of spread it out. You can see how Y 
encompasses all of, for example, the mutual information. Fixing this keeps these two atoms separate. Okay, that was one of the, in one of the homeworks we did the four variable. Okay, so that's just a little bit of review. So now, let's take this back to processes themselves. So we have, you know, the first problem would be, oh my god, I've got this, you know, the process is specified by this joint distribution of a bi-infinite chain of random variables. What a horrible mess. That's an infinite dimensional information diagram. Not useful. Well, the trick here is just to think of the past and the future as aggregate random variables, as if they were in individual random variables. So now we have two of these, and so we can start with a, just do this analysis of a process over past future, and we just start with a two variable I diagram, and then sort of apply um, the properties that we know, and uh, sort of simplify things. So first of all, <coughs> Okay, we're going to start with the past as this composite random variable, same thing with the future. We have all these different information measures here. Things, things, information quantities we can write down, but they're really just three atoms. There's these two conditional uncertainties, uncertainty in the future given the past, uncertainty in the past given the future, and then the mutual information between past and future. So that's easy enough to do, should be very familiar. In fact, we've barely changed anything compared to the two-variable case, right? Then we have the excess entropy. Okay, fair enough. So, so this is the uh, you know uncertainty in the future given the past. Um, the overlap is the excess entropy, the mutual information, and so on. Okay, so now with this as sort of background, we have this new random variable. What causal state are we in? Right? So we can ask how is the causal state related to the future and the past. So that means we're going to use a, a three variable I diagram. So we're going to bring in the, the epsilon machine and we're going to start with the general three variable I diagram and sort of get rid of pieces that we can, if we can. Okay. So again, the, the random variables are past, future, and causal state. And then we have, you know, this requisite long list of possible information quantities we could write down. And then uh, we have, well, we have three <coughs> variables in our I diagram. That means we have two to three minus one or seven atoms, independent pieces. So let's build this up now. And also apply some of the things we know to simplify if we can. Okay, so here's our, our future uh, marginal distribution. We have our, our past here. Okay, and then this will be, the yellow will represent the, the state information. And the question is, well, as I've drawn it, I've made the spatial relationships as if they were arbitrary random variables, just like in the three variable case. Okay, but, we, but there's more we know, okay. So in particular, this brown wedge down here, this is, well, it's the mutual information between the past and the future. That's this big piece, the excess entropy. And then I condition on the state information. I pull that out. So what do we know about this? How much information does the past share with the future given that I know the causal state? None. It's zero, right? That's shielding. Right? That's one of the first properties we proved. So that's zero. So it's actually a Markov chain. So there's a Markov chain. Past goes to causal state, goes to future is a Markov chain. That's good, like we said before. One of the theorems we proved was, ah, they're kind of this, these causal states are sort of Markovian in a general sense. So, okay, that's good. Let's get rid of that. So we have our kind of fan fold here of our three random variables. Uh, what else can we comment on here? Well, let's look at, let's look at this wedge, okay? This piece here. Okay, that is the, the, the state information. And I remove the past. Oops, sorry, and I remove the past. Right, so, so, it, so it's, this, it's this crescent here, and I remove the past. So how uncertain am I in the causal state if I've seen the past? You know exactly what it is, how we built the darn things, right? So, right, if I have a past, it's the epsilon function. The epsilon function is a function. I plug in any past, it tells me the name of the state I'm in or the state I'm in. So that is also zero. Okay, so we just proved that 
Actually, all of the state information has to be contained in the past. Hmm. Okay, well, we built it from the past, so it's a little bit intuitive, but one has to prove this. In addition, if we have a process that's not trivial, this piece over here, this will be the past where I've removed the state information, and there'll be some, just because I know what state I'm currently in, I don't know what particular past took me there, so there'll be some uncertainty if I know the state, what past happened. Okay, so, so this wedge will have a positive area here. So that means the state information has to be smaller to that extent. So it's, it's, it's contained within, this is contained within the past, but it has to be smaller than it. Okay, so, so that's the argument that this, this piece has to be positive for certain, in the general case. Um, so now let, let, me, let me redraw this a little more cleanly. So this will be our past. Changing the shape here just to make the, the boundaries work. We just argued that the state information, the statistical complexity has to be wholly contained within this, but it's strictly smaller in the general case. Uh, now we have the past, right? Um, okay, and then now we've got this, this atom over here, right? So this is the future. When I subtract off the, the past. We have, of course, where the past and the future overlap. That's the excess entropy. But you, now you're starting to notice the relationship to the state information. Contains E. In fact, as we did before, I can replace histories with causal state. They, they give me the same, essentially the same information. So now E, we can see is actually, the, not only is it the mutual information between the past and the future, it's the mutual information between the causal state and the future. I can do the same thing over here, right? I had the uncertainty in the future given the past. Well, that's the same thing as the uncertainty in the future given the causal state. So now we're starting to actually simplify the diagram a bit using, using the causal states. There's, there's quite a bit we, we, we can say about this. Same thing over here. This was the uncertainty in the, 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 the past given the causal state, right? That's this, this green wedge here. Now, there's sort of one atom left over. So what is this? Well, symbolically, you can just write out what it is. It is the state information, and I subtract off the future. So that's what the yellow crescent is. So that's sort of strange. Here I am in the causal state. Well, let me say it this way. Here's a particular future. What causal state I'm in? I'm uncertain to some degree, to the extent that that's a positive area or positive quantity. Given that I know the future, what's my uncertainty in the current state? That's sort of strange, but it does smack a little bit of the issues we talked about before in terms of thinking about retrodicting, like the time asymmetry discussion. So, okay, so there are a few things, few, few more things we can say here. So the first thing I want to do is uh, think about this guy um, and actually sort of correct what is, I just kind of pointed out before, a little bit kind of sloppy notation. So this is the uncertainty in the future given the causal state. Well, these causal states are supposedly optimally predictive, so we can show, in fact, that that, that atom, and now I'm going to be careful and put the actual length of the future. So there's this future block of length L conditioned on the causal state. Well, that's actually just the length of the block times h mu. Right? If I know the causal state, I'm predicting every next step with an uncertainty, so we calculate h mu, with h mu bits of uncertainty. So how can we see that? Pretty straightforward, proof's not too long. Well, uh, let me just go from this quantity back to what we were working with in the, in the uh, I diagram. I can just replace the, the causal state with the past here. And then uh, let me just expand out. What I mean here, of course, is that this is a block random variable with L individual symbols. So here I am with, I'm kind of drop some indices here. This is a past that ends just before, at minus one, just before this history block begins. So this is the past, and then this is immediately following L block. And then we just play some information identity games. This is the, the sort of joint conditional entropy chain rule. So what I can do here is choose to pull out 
from this joint distribution on this, on this side, x0. But if I do that, I have to add on this other entropy term, the uncertainty in x0 given the past. Well, this is a new past, except advanced one time. So I'm just going to denote that this, although I should put an index here. So, so now we've got this single symbol prediction here from the past, and now I've got this L minus 1 block I'm trying to predict from this shifted past that comes right up to this future. And so on. I just keep doing this each time pulling out a single symbol. So I would pull out x1 through the same kind of operation, and I'm going to get terms like that. And each time I'm, I'm readjusting the time origin of this past. Probably should have kept it. But that's OK if there are these different time origins. It's all stationary. Each one of these is now uh, the next symbol conditioned on the immediately preceding past. Those are going to be the same through the assumption of stationarity. And I have L of those terms. So I have L times the single step uncertainty. And that's just L times H mu. So we actually know a lot about this. So now I don't have to lie to you anymore. You know, th what I was saying before, especially when I wrote out something like this, this is ridiculous. This is for a generic stochastic process. This is infinite. <laughs> I drew it as a finite bubble. But actually, we now know how it scales. In the sense, it's kind of foliated with every L. It's foliated, and it adds an area that's h mu each time. Now, you should almost imagine that what you're looking at is the block entropy growth here. It's foliated with histories. So as long as we know the causal state, we're in the state of optimal prediction, and, and each new symbol, on average, is going to be that informative. So it's just foliated by strips of width h mu, or area h mu, all the way out. So we know how it scales. So we don't have to worry about this really being infinite. We know exactly how it scales. Um, OK, but what about this guy, the mystery wedge, this bizarre thing, right? Uncertainty in the current state given the future. We already saw this on Tuesday. But now we can actually give it some, some meaning. So remember, we were talking about that the statistical complexity is always an upper bound on the excess entropy. It was a relatively straightforward pack and unpack your mutual information exercise. So E, you know, mutual information between the past and the future, well, I can kind of pull this out. I choose to pull out the future, and I subtract off the uncertainty of the future given the past. Well, that's fine. And then I can, of course, replace my past so I'm conditioning on with causal states. But then this looks like a mutual information. So it's actually, I just rewrote this as the mutual information between the states and the future. Well, we already kind of concluded that. But then I can unpack this again. So I pull out the uh, uncertainty in the causal states minus the uncertainty in the causal states given the future. That's, that's it. Now, before what we did is I just observed that this is always a positive quantity. And if I drop it, then this will always be less than the first term, which is the statistical complexity. So that's how we got are bound between the internal state information and this observed mutual information, the upper bound. Okay, But it's explicit. So this wedge is playing this role. right? This is the mystery wedge. Before, we just ignored it. But it just showed up. We can no longer ignore it. It's sitting there in the middle of our information diagram. And what, it, what this is telling us is that this, this mystery wedge, what it's doing, it's controlling the difference between the internal state information and E. Right? If this is 0, then they would be the same. So now we actually have a criteria for when the observed information and internal state information will be the same. So when that conditional entropy is 0. It's still a little bit weird to be thinking about my uncertainty in the current state given the future. So, um, so you can just sort of write this thing out. This is, forget this inequality here, I can just rewrite this as I now have an explicit expression for this. It's still kind of mysterious in interpretation, but I know it's c mu minus z. E. It's controlling this. So in a sense, it's how hidden the state information is. So we call it the crypticity. Right? You have a process with all this internal state information, like we said before, in the, the cryptographic processes. E could be arbitrarily close to zero, looking very much like a fair coin, but there could be lots of internal state information. And what happens is somehow, the process and how it's producing its observed symbols, it's spreading out that state information over very long time scales. And that's sort of crudely speaking, this crypticity measures that. So we're going to come back and um, talk about crypticity a lot more. It's sort of a central idea in trying to answer how hidden, hidden processes are. 
So let me just finish up here with one final observation. It's maybe not quite so interesting as discovering the crypticity, but uh, if you remember, we had those sort of two outside atoms in the in process information diagram, and if you remember, we actually had this metric here. The distance between two random variables is, is the sum of their two conditional entropies. Well, that's exactly the form we have here. So if we sum up the outside wedges, we actually have this funny quantity. It's the distance between the past and the future. Somehow it just seems almost poetic. What's the distance between the past and the future? And we can say, say more about this. In particular, from the information diagram, we know that the you know, uncertainty in the past given the future, we just showed that, that was on the, the, the left-hand side, that's this uncertainty in the past given the causal state plus the, plus the crypticity. Um, and then on the right-hand side, the uncertainty of the future given the past of length L, well, that was just H mu, we just derived that. So we can actually write out explicitly what this distance is between the past and the future. It's these two terms. There's this retrodictive term, current causal state in the past. There's the mystery wedge of crypticity, and then it scales linearly with um, the length we're going into the future. So there's actually quite a bit we understand about the, the, the information diagram now. Kind of, or it helped us understand these things. So what's going on? We talked about this mystery wedge, have this tentative interpretation that it's measuring the, the, the how hidden the state information is from the observed. Uh, talking about retrodiction, sort of some things um, are the same in reverse time, but other things aren't, in particular the structure of the epsilon machines can be different. So we need, this is all set up, we, we need some more tools here. So that's gonna be the, the role of next week. So these things, it's, it's a generalization of the notion of of causal state, we call them mixed states. And this is gonna allow us, the techniques will allow us to take a given epsilon machine and reverse it in time to in a sense get the forward machine of the reverse process explicitly analytically. And then we can start talking about, then we won't worry anymore about reversing time because we'll have a way of going back and forth when we switch the direction of time. So, so that's it um, for today. Um, unless you have some questions. <laughs>